going to mug me? I might get a mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run a decent marathon. Download Veely now. hits you, the way it hits the mouth, the way it trails, that feeling of exhilaration, of intricate, yes, everything's clear. The most important process in tea is this part. It's called sardine. It's killing the green. So this is killing the humidity. Ooh, hot so I thought, what the hell is in this to create this alchemy of tremendous clarity, high beyond words, feeling a social warmth towards people? And this gets out some of the moisture, and you can see this old rattan stained with tea oil and tea moisture from years of rolling. And the fragrance is unreal. I had to get into that world, whatever that meant. So literally 10 years of my life were spent tracking trade routes, the remnants of the T-Horse Road. And the last traders who were trading up until the early 1950s, people never really accessed their, their storerooms of memories. I, I just thought, well, why the hell isn't this route been documented? It's a great story. And we risk losing a massive part of history. Poor tea. One of the original teas, the bigger leaf species, is here in loads, tens of kilos. And our chashifu, our tea master. This is Gushu. Old tree tea. Higher value, bigger leaves. This is the year of I was born in Ottawa and raised in Manitic, a little town south of Ottawa. I grew up in a slightly Hungarian household, and what I mean by slightly Hungarian means slightly neurotic, and maybe not so slightly. So food was coming in that nobody had ever eaten. So these are just broken up pieces from mushroom-shaped compressed teas that have been broken apart. I was taking pheasant sandwiches to a, a junior high school where everybody played hockey and, and uh, listened to Motley Crue, and here I'm showing up with a pheasant sandwich. Uh, People of discriminating uh, tastes wouldn't buy that. People who love tea would definitely go in for that. I'd be in for that. So all of this stuff in my dad's kitchen was just coming at me, and tea was one of those things. Fast forward to Taiwan. And I thought I was going on a date with a nice young Taiwanese woman, and in fact, no. What she had introduced as a, an introduction to something very Taiwanese, which I thought was going to be the date, ended up being an introduction to something very Taiwanese. 
I was welcomed by close to a dozen people who each brought their own teapot, their own tea. And I quickly realized these were people who were entirely committed to the leaf. It's harvest, the cultivation, the discussion, and far from being pretentious, this was obsessive interest in tea. So that began a whole sort of phase of learning the leaf. I have been here before and I wasn't sure it still existed. Josh, it's great to see these little shops are surviving. It's difficult, I think, because coffee culture is young. It's young, it's everything new, it's, it's a little bit exciting and trendy, but tea is still where it's at here. And I mean, this is the home of tea culture. But uh, to be, it has to be said, there's a lot of crap tea being served as well, particularly in the West where people's palates don't know a good tea from a bad tea. And it's, these people, they don't do bad tea. Big red robe, it's a roasted oolong. It's like a perfume. And this is one of the most expensive teas when it's rare and produced well in the world. There are tea auctions held where tea of this kind, Da Hong Pao, 50 grams, can go for tens of thousands of US dollars. It's like tea porn for some of us. Crucial, crucial point he just made. Serving coffee is very quick. The process is quick. You get a coffee, you sip it, it's gone. Tea still needs the aspect of time. It need, still needs that benefit of wonderful time. And he doesn't worry so much about the coffee, but he does say a lot of young people are drinking coffee. But it's a different culture. He's talking about tea being much healthier for the body, for the health, for the... So he thinks tea has longevity on its side, which I like. I like an optimism, even when it's delusional. Um, but these tea shops surely are disappearing. So you go down downtown where people are shopping, you're hard pressed to find tea shops. Even 10, 15 years ago, you'd always be offered tea in a traditional Chinese home. Now that's becoming, would you like Coke? Would you like a little shot of coffee? We've got a coffee maker, by the way. Coffee is eternally available, it seems. And yet coffee lacks the story. There's no tail. It's a bean that was introduced. It's modern. If we talk on this flowing chart of, of fluid that's, that's created from, from these leaves, if you're looking at a single point of origin, the Camellia sinensis asamica, the big leaf varietal, can find its home in the south of Yunnan and can, can call itself one of the origins of all tea on the planet. Has to be grown, produced, cultivated, harvested in Yunnan province. The 
best of Pu'er is essentially er everything is done by hand with a master at each stage, the harvest, the cultivation, the frying, the withering, the tea that we know as dry dust in bags that we've grown up in the West with was something made for the addition of milk and sugar. We're talking about mass production. We're talking about an industry rather than family businesses. Here, we're talking about tea from bushes and trees that are allowed to kind of go bonkers. They're allowed to live unpruned, unmolested, unfertilized. So when people think of tea bushes and where the origins of tea, they don't often think of a tea forest. And this is literally a tea forest. A lot of these trees are hundreds of years old. This is probably two to 300 years. And what's beautiful about this area is that the tea bushes which sort of surround the circumference of this tea forest are the great grandchildren of these original tea trees. Surrounded by a symphony, a chorus of cicadas up here in Hukai Mountain. Standing next to a deity in this part of the world, a 750-year-old tea tree that produces tea that goes for a few thousand a kilo. So this little gem would constitute a perfect pluck. And when I say perfect pluck, it is literally one bud and one leaf. The more value to tea, the more likely you're you're going to see just these end leaves and buds, sometimes with two leaves and one bud. This is where you start to get a lot of the antioxidants, the phytochemicals, the catechins, all of the, the essences are going into the end part. So when tea is clipped, there's no machines up here, it's done with a single slice of the fingernail. And it is from this one bud and one leaf that one can literally create anything from a white tea, to a yellow tea, to a green tea, to a black tea to a blue or qing or oolong tea. The color designation of a tea has nothing to do with what color it appears in a, in a cup. What it is, is it's the process after which this is harvested. Pu'er is the one tea that once it's been fried, produced, and caked or dried, will develop with time and increase with age, developing a new chemistry and new medicinal aspects to it. It is the one tea that doesn't really have a lifespan. It is in continual development. All teas that are picked besides Pu'er have between a four and 18 month lifespan before they flatten and become in Mandarin what they call dust. This is the cradle of all tea. This is, this is mile zero. This is the origin of all origins of tea. Right around us. It is from here that tea made its way to all points of the compass down into Vietnam, to Laos, through Burma, up into the Tibetan Plateau, tea in Japan, tea in Korea, tea in Africa right now, that can trace its lineage and its DNA literally back to these regions in some form. Mong Hai is the center point of tea for the Tea Horse Road. For me, this is a little town that became a big city in a matter of the last six, seven, eight years I've been coming here. It's basically a collection point for some of the best pourers in the world. There's three, 400 shops here of just selling tea. Arguably, it is the most tea-centric town that, that one can find in Asia. It is 24-7 tea. Um, if you see less than 80 or 90% of tea shops on the street, you're either in a residential area or you are in a farm zone. So it is everything. And every tea shop owner 
as their own clients, their own relationships uh, with both the cultivating peoples and with buyers from the big cities. Morning. Good, it's a day to get entirely high on tea. There's enough knowledge and enough information and medicinal detailing of tea. Now it's time to just get ripped. Mm. There's actually a term in Mandarin for an, a tea addict. It's called chaping, so you've got tea sickness. And literally, it's this compound. It's not one stimulant in tea. In a really good, unmanipulated tea, a fresh tea, you have a ball of hundreds of stimulants working together, so it's all working together to hit you in the neurological system, in the capillary blood flow area. It increases your blood circulation while sort of not depressing, but relaxing your heart muscle. So at the th same time, you're having all of this multitude of, of wonderful stimulant effects hitting you, and you get buzzy. May is first and foremost a, a, a friend whose contributions to my tea education have been nothing less than, than, than huge. <laughs> May is ethnically Hani, which is one of the, the most important of the tea cultivating peoples of southern Yunnan. And she has a tea shop that's maybe about 80 square feet. Um, and it's basically 24 hours of, of tea serving, of generosity, of men and women coming in off the street saying hi, sitting down, sucking back tea, and issuing out these little tidbits of, of genius indigenous tea knowledge. Over the years, the tea has been amazing. It's been plentiful, it's been flowing, there's been meals. And basically, this has become like a second home, this little tea shop. May talks instinctively about tea because she knows it through generations of her family. She talks about the people. She understands the relationship between the growers and cultivators and the tea bushes. And she just understands what a good tea should be. So the methodology of the pouring of tea is important for consistency's sake. When you're dealing with high-end teas or pure, unadulterated teas, and when you're dealing with drinkers, and when you're dealing with the tradition of bringing people together for tea, you need consistency. So first, there's an initial rinse. The temperature for pu'er is fully boiled. The first infusion, usually, but not always, is used to cleanse the tea get rid of dust particles, eliminate a little bit of the bitterness. May uses anywhere from 10 to 14 grams, but infuses it for literally only seconds, maybe two, three seconds at the most. And she continues to pour for potentially 20 infusions. May always stresses three things. 
know the source, where tea comes from, know who makes the tea. Every village, every homestead has a master tea maker or a tea fryer. And let your mouth make the decision. If you know the basics of what a tea should taste like, trust yourself and trust the people you deal with. You're in my mouth. This is one of those really important aspects of tea uh, buying, is to meet the growers. Without knowing the source of a tea, you can't determine what quality of tea it is. So we're meeting the actual guy who grows the tea, who then sells the tea to May, who sells the tea to me. <laughs> Southern Yunnan, Pu'er tea, you cannot separate this idea of ethnicity and the type of tea that they grow. They're all growing Pu'er tea, slightly different techniques to fry and dry, but we're in a honey hotbed, which are the mountain people. It's important in the, in, the, in, the, in the long view of Yunnan province to understand that this part of China, as we call China now, was only brought into the Chinese or the Han Empire in the 13th century by the Mongols. This was an entirely minority uh, driven and ruled place. You've got 25 minorities. Every one of them has a tea culture. So we're at one of the highest altitude areas that grows Pu'er tea. We have some of the oldest tea trees around us and that you've got great drainage and you've got superb clay soil. That combined with the fact that you don't get direct rains or direct sunlight, you've got the perfect ingredients to make a, a, a tea. I would compare it to wine culture because you talk about the soil, you talk about the producer, you don't just speak about uh, the peach apricot flavored hues. This is a far deeper discussion. This is a, an intricate assessment of each stage of preparation, consummation, and appreciation. And now their tea trees are getting higher amounts of money. Uh, they have clients from Beijing and Shanghai coming here buying bulk tea. May, this spring, bought 112 kilos of his spring tea. That's his almost 60% of his entire stock. We're in the departure point for tea. This is the confluence of where the dried tea leaves come. They're collected, they're rolled, steamed, dried, and sent out to all points. This is where all the action happens. In the 1990s, the region of Pu'er that we're in, in the southern Yunnan, this area could not export, distribute its tea beyond officials, beyond certain parts of Yunnan. The indigenous here had great raw materials. The traditions stayed intact. The raw materials stayed intact. So in the 1990s, you had two kinds of tea. You had utter crap and you had stunners. We're within a factory now that produces stunners. It's interesting, a lot of people within China don't actually know what a good quality tea is. They drink tea, it's a tradition, but it's not thought about in sort of, well, we get it down from the store. And I mean, tea is not something so elite for a lot of regular people in China. This is still something that's treated like, you know, water. It's something they drink every day. Now you're getting coffee sort of moving into a lot of regions, which is actually not bad because a lot of the people who aren't serious tea growers are just flipping to coffee, which leaves better tea available.
Coffee's being grown, and the irony is uh, the best soils and the best labor is available in Yunnan province. I would say that tea culture being of something uh, very traditional and ancient is ebbing. expedition in the early 2000s which led me to Shangri-La and those mountains and specifically the T-Horse Road. The journey that T took I would I, I would argue is probably one of the most uh, physically daunting journeys that the, the world's known. The Silk Road is known, uh, for me, the T-Horse Road is more important, more culturally significant. It seemed like a natural extension of two obsessions that I've had since I was a boy, uh, mountains and tea. In the West, we have no idea about this route. Silk Road touched Europe, so it plays a bit of uh, a role in European history. This is entirely Himalayan. This is Northwest Yunnan province, but more importantly, before the delineations of borders, this was an old Tibetan stronghold called Gyeltong, the royal grasslands. And 10 years of my life were spent pretty much fixed in this location, tracking trade routes, the remnants of the T-Horse Road. This is one of the alleys that historically was part of the original T-Horse Road. So caravans would have come through here bearing gifts, bearing salt, tea, gems, aprons from Tibet. They would have been either on their way northwest and west to Tibet or south to Lijiang. This is Sonzenlin Monastery, one of the, one of the great epic monasteries of, of the Tibetan world. It's very important to realize that the monasteries and the spirit world were linked absolutely to economics and trade. Teas that were contributed to the monasteries would be hoarded. The monasteries would wait until the value of the tea went up and then trade it off. So monasteries actually made profits based on tea. Gyaltong was also a feeding point, a collector, sort of a collection point for traders, novice monks, migrants, pilgrims, thieves to sort of come together, form these massive caravans and make their way off onto the Tibetan plateau of Lhasa. So the ancient tea trees of southern Yunnan, the traders would bring them up to trading towns like Pu'er, like Dali. In turn, they would be changed, put onto mules, high altitude mules, if you will, and brought up here and then it would go through a series, another series of runners, or it would sort of be exchanged, put onto yet another mule, uh, who was handled by another horseman. So the commodity of tea would never really be handled by one sole person for the entire journey, or even one mule. It would go through a series of exchanges, and every time it went through an exchange, it gained in value. 
And so by the time it hit the market center points of Leh and Lhasa and Kathmandu, the value had accumulated just tremendous value. So I decided to document this T-horse road. And the first essential part was you assemble a team. Dakpa. And he was the one who's very, who's very vital in my life because he was the one that pointed at this wisp of a root one day and said, that's where I came from India. I said, well, what the hell is that? That's a route to India? And he says, that's the T-horse road. But actually, when we come from India, uh, Lhasa to here, took us two months on the track, you know? Born in India, he came over the T-horse road uh, with his father to immigrate back to his father's hometown of Shangri-La. I made an oath, promise, uh, with old friend Dakpa, that we would travel the route and bring it some of its, some of what it was due historically. Remember the one we went there with the Doja Kando, and you know, all this happened in the big snow? Yes. Then one of the, our mules fall down, no? Yeah. Because everything was a monotone of white, we couldn't yeah, see where the ledges see. were. The Even mule the fell. Cannot see. They couldn't see the Our route. luggage is going down. <laughs> mule fell down, ripped open its side, right. and all the luggage was all over the place. <laughs> we almost lost two people. Um, one of my dear friends turned to speak, and in a, in a split second was shooting down a glacier. Had he gone another a bit of distance, he would have been in a, in a gorge, uh, pulped, finished. They were what I like to refer to as languid hard men. They were, they were people who were mountain savvy, they were callous, they were bruisers, but they were also linguistically savvy, and we needed that. <laughs> Through the, the Tibetan plateau, you've got you've got four or five main dialects, and you've got dozens of sort of mini dialects. So we needed people who were not only savvy but able to be in the mountains for extended periods of time. One of the provisos was they had to drink tea and they had to be able to be patient with being lost. Salim showed up, he was literally uh, a waif. I really looked at him and wondered, can this guy trek for 52 days, hardcore, above 4,000 meters, lugging 30 kilos of gear? Well, the answer was yes. Actually, I was growing in a, uh, in a village, yes. When I was 10 ages, I used to gra graze in the yaks and cows and uh, horses, go up and down, up and down. 87% of his mass his lungs. <laughs> now we have only small snow now. When we track is the Shola, it's the first time, and uh, the snow on this year west. Shola cannot be, it, it cannot be overstated. In all of the interviews preceding our journey, Shola was always referred to as the two-faced pass. It's a 4,800-meter 4, behemoth of unimaginable peace and beauty in the spring months and the summer months, and uh, brutal ferocity in the, in the winter months. It's, um, it's a killer. It is the first of the major snow passes between Gyaltong, Shangri-La, and Lhasa. Probably the most deadly in that uh, all of the old traders said, when you're crossing, you have to beware of winds and you should never rest at the summit praying or thanking the deities for too long. You must get off the pass and over because the storms, if they, the deities that lie within, if they see you as taking too many liberties on the summit, on the pass, they'll strike you down.
and it's buzzing. I get buzzy now because we're about to actually embark on one of the most potent and probably one of the most important small sections of the T-Horse Road, the ascent to Shola. It's gonna take us about two days of heavy slogging and much is gonna depend on the snow. If there's a lot of snow at the top, it's gonna be a hard slog. So we're a few kilometers up from the trailhead, halfway to Shola. Um, halfway being distance-wise, not time-wise. We've got a, a full day's trek ahead before we hit Shola. And uh, the morning begins as it ha does all over this place, with tea, with sampa, with butter, with sugar, with a bit of silence and a lot of smoke. The teas that the locals drink should be looked at as a fuel. Carbohydrates, the addition of electrolytes with salt, butter, carbohydrates and calories. So tea for them, and of course for me, is, is, is much more than a, an afternoon sit down with a bit of a mm, It's more of a, a full on meal. Oh, yeah. So one's loose leaf, one's a brick. This was very popular, and it still is for the Tibetans, sheerly because of its transportability. So tea like this was steamed, formed into these shapes, and then uh, sent to every point of the compass. And the Tibetans love it because they can transport it, particularly mountain men, where they just take a little bit of the tea, whittle it off, put it into the pots, into the kettles, and instead of infusing the tea, they stew it over time. So the teas that they drink have been you know, 20, 30 minutes of stewing. The addition of butter and salt. This is as non-pasteurized as you can get. It's non-PC butter, but loaded with vitamins. Then they put it in a bowl, sip, and at the end, what they'll do is they'll actually pour in some barley powder or tsampa, grind it in to create this actual ball, which is often, often shoved into a pocket to feed the mules and often just to take a nip of during the day as we, as we take in the mountains. We'll see how far the horses can make it, um, but maybe the horses can just remain at base camp while the rest of the team goes to Shola. What's really exciting about the journey today is there's pilgrims coming in a cir circumambulation because this is the year of the sheep. So this is sort of a celebratory year every 12 years for this mountain. It was a zigzag of people and mules and hoofs and feet ascending up into the beyond the tree line. So to do a Waijuang, what they call, or a Kora, around this mountain range, once in your lifetime is considered something sacred. And it's utterly physical, and this is something about the, the, the spiritual concept up in the Himalayas. Everything has a bit of a masochistic, physical component to it.
So we're on an approach to Shola, which is right over there. On a good day, it's, it's, it's stunning, 90 degrees with sun. On a bad day, you can get blizzards running in here in 10 minutes. And this is literally one of the most important passes, not only on the T-Horse Road, but this was the gateway to Tibet. Every time I've been up there, and close to a dozen times now, it's a different, it's a different world, it's a different, slightly different shade. I meet different pilgrims, and it's reasserted that how important this pass is. And I've, I've got a, how should I put this? It's like an old relationship you can't shake. We've summited Shola, the pass at 4,800 meters. Uh, for caravans to reach this point, it was a great celebration. It was also a celebration because this is the first of the great snow passes traveling from Yunnan into and onto the Tibetan Plateau. It's a pilgrimage route which has become known. So you're getting people who know very little. You're getting dedicated pilgrims who go once a year, uh, all convening on the 4,800 meter Shola Pass. You're getting, you're getting guides with boy band hair and running shoes meeting up there, leading tremendously under underprepared uh, tourists who want to, you know, be a part of this journey. As much as the Himalayas are about a perception of spirituality, you cannot take commerce or economics out of the equation. The, the way to think about it is a superhighway of luxury items coming on to some of the remote parts of the planet. And when we say luxury, we're talking about tea, salt, resin, copper, leather, uh, Chama Gudao is the name in Mandarin. Uh, literally, tea, horse, ancient root. The Tibetans, I, I feel, have a, a little more accurate description. They called it the wide road. They also called it the mule road. So anything that had value, any commodity that had value, anywhere along this 5,000 kilometer length would be traded. Typewriters were coming in the 20th century. That way is Tibet, permits, visas, we don't have them, nobody gets them to do what we want to do. So we're basically paying homage, uh, as much a personal respect uh, as we are paying respect to the trade, we're paying respect to the mountains and the deities which have allowed us up here. The history of the T-Horse Road 
largely is an oral narrative. And the last traders who were trading up until the early 1950s, people never really accessed their, their storerooms of memories. And they're still very much alive and well and very vibrant. And a lot of the elders actually started inviting me over for these extended tea breaks, which went into whiskey breaks. So interviews which began, we thought with maybe 30 minutes allotted, would end up becoming four-day interviews. And they weren't just interviews, they were living with them, uh, waking up with them, going on tangents with them, getting lost. A good portion of seven and a half months was spent getting lost in the mountains. A lot of the, the elders knew that the story should be told. They often wondered why a whitey was doing it. That's, that's the way it rolls. But they were quite proud and quite detailed in their memories of families that were along the route. So I took these notes of the maybe 50 or 60 that I've interviewed over the years. 80, 85 percent have passed away. If there isn't a database of all of these stories, then we risk losing a massive part of history. This pass is called Kala. 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 The idea that for 1,300 years nothing stopped tea trade. The priority was to get tribute teas to the Tibetans. This is not the Tibet we think about. We risk losing this vital piece of Himalayan history that linked three dozen minorities, language, and it, and it, it linked the ancient commodity, the stimulant fuel tea. When we began the journey, we had no idea. I thought it would take four months. It took almost twice that, seven and a half months of, of travel, most of which was by foot. And the people along the way emphasized, reiterated, confirmed, corroborated tea was, is still the most important commodity that there was. Lhasa gets recognized for its spiritual uh, hub, its, its, its holy marks, its holy spots. But Lhasa was a great market, Himalayan market town for, for centuries. So you had all these runners, all these mini caravans uh, splicing reforming, splicing again, striding all over the Himalayan plateau and beyond. So tea kind of, tea literally and figuratively flowed down into the valleys, down into these remote corridors. And it is the one consistent plant matter you will find in the Himalayas in every home, tea. And this, this route was used by local traders to go up to Lhasa, act as middlemen, act as bartering chiefs for their villages, for their towns, for their monasteries in the Kalakandaki, and basically collect what was needed for this 
this vital swath of, of, of nomadic culture and these, these villages tucked away in the valleys. The nomads for me represent something vital, understated, and entirely necessary in this talk of trade and tea. Well, I think tea for the nomads means something more than perhaps anyone else on this entire journey through the Himalayas because their luxuries are basically all from leagues away. The tent that we entered into was basically a, a billowing bit of yak wool with simple essentials for people who move up to six times a year. Mar. Dimar. 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 Nothing is done in a, in a nomadic tent without first starting with tea in the morning. And when we asked one of the women in the tent what tea means, her answer was quite simple and I think probably closer to oh, yeah. tea's essence than, than any other explanation. It's everything. It's the morning, it's the afternoon, it's a gift, it's a tribute, it's a welcome. Say wudu. Wudu. Tea of the hills. The tea that began the journey in southern Yunnan could be traveling for six months. And even its chemistry changed along the routes. Oh, yeah. By the time it reached Lhasa, Pu'er had undergone this transformation. It had actually oxidized and composted, so to speak. Oh, yeah. The cups are presented to guests in a very formal way. And the ceremony, the, the, the welcoming aspect of it is brilliant and something very touching from people who can ill afford to be giving things away in their tent. Mm. <laughs> Where is the salt coming from? Over? Yeah, Sewang was an interesting one. His method of communicating with locals, um, very much a man of the people, and very much somebody who could ask a question in a way that an elder a Tibetan could understand, and that a young, youngish, Western whitey could as well. These walls, we've been looking, we've been just, you've taken me around this city. The walls here are hugely thick. Why so thick? Were there bandits? What was the, what was the reason for the thickness of these walls? Because this is, these are meters yeah. thick. Yeah. This was walled you know, uh, as a protection from enemies. Right. So this is, you know, this was well protected. This has only one door, you know, which only, you know, opened in the morning and at night it used to be closed. You know, like it's it's a city. You know, the the capital of Mustang. Mm. Uh, once Mustang was independent, 
And you know, when uh, Amir Pal, the first king of Mustang, declared Mustang as an independent kingdom in the 14th century, and that's the time you know the Mustang was formed. So this has been a very, very important town, you know, like because all the trade that took place between India, Nepal, uh, and Tibet, you know, that was passing through, you know, like Mustang. So this was the main trade route for, you know, like salt, wool, and also for tea. But then in the recent time, what has happened is we've been cut off. You know, like trade from Tibet, you know, stopped uh, when, you know, Tibet was taken over by China. And therefore trade and commerce, you know, declined. Economic conditions of the people declined. And monastic orders also, you know, declined, which means, you know, Buddhism declined. That's incredible. Mm-hmm. So the, the first, you know, like uh, the trade uh, was when he was 14 years old mm-hmm. and he went as far as Lekse, which is the nearest town in Tibet from yes. Mustang. Lekse. 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 Yeah. I mean, the, these guys are my heroes. Shipudu, uh, Shipumudu. He remembers the days of tea coming from uh, the trade route before this whole cultural revolution, where trade routes were still very much fluid and organic things that borders were just thoughts rather than any delineated fence lines. Has he ever had a cup of coffee? Coffee tung you no. Coffee tung you coffee. I mean, today man, they can't see but one. So just so I can go and carry it there now. Uh, I've, I've taken coffee. It's not good for me, he says. He feels dizzy and he goes with this Tibetan tea. This is much better. I'm used to this, he said. <laughs> he remembers the tea quality being superb. And what he said was the tea that used to be traded was stronger, more flavor. Smaller amounts would make multiple, multiple infusions of their stewed buja or boja, the Tibetan churn tea. And he, and, he, and he was quite irate with this whole, uh, you know, this descent of quality of the tea. Dela, oh yeah. Okay, so like once Tibet was taken over, you know, like the, the good tea uh, they stopped. Didn't, yeah, they didn't <laughs> want to send anything, you know, so they completely stopped the border. So there was no trade at all. They can mix it, huh? Mix it. Uh-uh. They need to mix it well. They've mixed it with mm-hmm. good and bad tea, but mm-hmm. in the old days, they used to have heavier bricks of great tea. He says now, mm-hmm. the weight has gone, there's more stems in the tea, and you get one good infusion out of this serving, and then no taste. I almost feel we should give the tea cake too. Yeah, sure. You think it's okay? Yeah, definitely. This was great. So during the discussion, I decided on the spot that I was going to present him with a tea cake that I would have liked to have kept. But in hindsight, I needed to, this man, it was like a badge. I wanted to bring him this tea cake from the origins that has traveled with us for over 5,000 kilometers. So in Tibet, you know, like uh, people were so much into tea, they even just, you know, like chewed. As they were drinking sometimes. Yeah, they chewed uh, tea, you know, like this, like he's doing. And, you know, he's saying, like, like how people drink coffee, they were, like, into tea in olden times. When was the last time you saw tea of this quality?
Oh, yeah, it's been about 25 years since he hasn't seen such a good tea. Oh, Right now we are in a monastery called uh, Tsarang uh, Sherub Darjeeling Monastery. And this is a very, very important uh, monastery uh, in the entire region of Mustang, you know, because this monastery is believed to be uh, an epicenter for the spread of Tibetan Buddhism uh, in the late 14th centuries. So I now introduce Royal Blood of Mustang. <laughs> oh, Royal thank Blood. you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so can you explain yeah. to us a little of your, who was the king oh. and who are you? Okay, so you know, like uh, the kingdom of Mustang, you know, it was established uh, in the late 14th century by my, you know, forefathers. You know, Amepal was the first king of Mustang, and the present king is the 24th king in the lineage, direct descendant of this, you know, king. 24th. Is the 24th okay. king uh, of this dynasty. So, you know, like, uh, I am the, uh, the nephew of the present king of Mustang. Mm. My grandfather, you know, my mother's father was the earlier king, and then my mother's brother, mother's brother, you know, became the king. So the present king is my uncle. So I'm his nephew. So can we call you un Uncle King, Nephew King? <laughs> no problem, no. Jeff. <laughs> call me Tewang. <Tawang. laughs> you know, this is the uh, monastery kitchen. So this is where the tea was made, actually. You know, these are the, these are the vessels where tea was made. And this is, you know, like how the tea is served, chaffing. This yeah. is called chaffing, you know. Uh, you know, feeding tea to, you know, like maybe 30 to 40 monks at one time. So these are big ones, you know, which, which are very special to this monastery. Beautiful. Tea definitely was a part of everybody's life here in Mustang. You know, without tea, we cannot survive. The first thing that you do in the morning is drink tea. You offer the tea to God, you know, first, and then, you know, like you offer yourself and to your family. Without tea, I think people cannot survive in this region. His sister made the, the, that pungent, wonderful fuel uh, known as bocha, Tibetan churn tea. And basically, you continue to drink. The cup never gets, never goes empty. And the tea must be consumed while hot. And the tea cannot be wasted because once the butter uh, within the fluid uh, goes to room temperature or gets cool, it forms almost a lard. Not good for the stomach. Uh, but this, this, this tea ceremony was extraordinary in its simplicity.
company is situated at the confluence of two rivers. So this is, you know, Kali Gandha uh -huh. And that's Kak Sampo. Kak Sampo. Yeah, Kak Sampo. Uh, this uh, is Kak uh, River. Uh, uh. So because it's situated on the confluence, it, that's why it's called Kak Beni, you know. Kali Gandaki Valley was very, very important in early times for trade, you know, because this was the main trade route uh, between Tibet, Nepal, and India. So that's why, you know, Mustang flourished because it was the main trading point between these points. And that's why, you know, Mustang flourished culturally, uh, religiously, and also economically they prospered because, you know, it was located in such a strategic region. Mm. So tea would be coming down these valleys on caravans, salt, leather, incense. This was kind of a, a trade highway, so to speak, through the Himalayas. Well, yes, uh, definitely, you know, it was the main highway. This valley was like a, a perfect line drawn from Lhasa down to Kathmandu. So trade, traders, automobiles in the later years, single file carried over the borders. Um, it, it, it was, it represents, I think, one of the most beautifully simplistic trade routes, extensions of the tea horse road that, it, that one could find. I don't think the Tea Horse Road has been really given its due as to how much it affected, in a positive way, relationships between cultures which could never speak to each other. It's also made me realize that, that Tea's journey, the literal journey, um, is one of the reasons why it is the second most consumed fluid on the planet. Uh, it, these were epic journeys to get Tea to every single valley. Uh, in the Himalayas. This has been uh, sort of a, a brilliant bit of education. Coming down into the Kalikandaki Valley, into the ancient capital of Lomantong and Sarang, down to Kathmandu. I like to think of it as the retirement community. Uh, this was not only a spiritual capital, but a market, a market capital as well. Uh, the traders upon reaching would also do this whole, they would get rid of their tea and salt and they would go immediately to do the pilgrimage. This, this valley, historically, for thousands of years, has been temperate. So Pema. Can you remember the days when tea and salt and caravans were coming through the valleys? And a lot of Tibetans simply stayed here after making an epic journey, one too many, and, and retiring here to do the mala, pray, drink tea, relax, and maybe think back to the journeys that they made. Initially, he really worked hard, uh, even, you know, carried loads on his uh, back. And then later, you know, he was able to buy yaks, you know, like horses. And then he could, you know, like use these to, you know, like carry more stuff, right? So because of that, he was able to gain more wealth. They would talk in this old language about a journey of two weeks being a journey of three passes, two lakes, one village on the left, and a formidable woman in town number three. They would describe journeys this way. They would give it color. 
We met traders who probably, given what they told us, traveled 40, 50,000 kilometers in their lives by foot, ushering this green stimulant across the top of the world. I wanted to ask about the trade routes and the dangers along the trade routes. How difficult was it to travel the trade routes? My feeling is that the tea route hasn't lost any of its luster. It's only become more important to the development of the Himalayas, uh, the development of the relationship between the mega powers of India, Jagar to the Tibetans, and Jage, China. They, most of people died due to a snowfall, snowfall. You know, with, because of the coldness. Right. You know, they're standing, they're still carrying the weight on the hill, and they're standing and dying because of the cold, and not by falling off the cliff. It's made me very cognizant of how bound these roots, DNA, trade, pilgrims, th this route was everything. It was a pipeline, it was, a, it was an absolute essential highway through the sky. The, the Tibetans describe it beautifully when they, dis they describe it as being the eternal road. Maldanath's stupa, one of the great epicenters of faith, and certainly one of the great collection points for uh, traders in the past. It's a wonderful collection of everything mountain. But coffee, again, the great, the great enemy from the south, um, has, has made its way into the city. Reminds me a little bit of Beijing in the sense that tea houses are getting fewer and fewer. Tea's emigration out of these little green bastions of China to all points of the compass. This is a tale that needs to be told, and, and you know, one one Tibetan, I'll never forget him. It was talking to him for hours, a little bit of whiskey was passed. Uh, he went on this sort of tirade about the fact that, um, you know, a good story needs to be told. And it's a great story. <laughs>